to a mic for questions. We'll start with John, and then we'll go to Ben after that. How weird is it? It's a Thursday. You're not playing for the first time since April. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was kind of nice to get into that little rhythm or routine that we were in, but also when you get to this point in the year where it's a little hotter, um, the games can be a little more stressful, and, and your pitchers have been used throughout the year. I think everyone will take an added day. So really, if you look at it, um, we left Starkville. That was, that was a taxing day. I just got done talking about it with the, with the TV folks. Um, you have a, a day where we score over 20 runs, then maybe our best win of the season uh, in game two. And then game three in Starkville was just hot, and it was just long. We both used a lot of pitchers being the last day of the regular season. And then we had four days because of the rain to kind of get our feet back from underneath us, get prepared, um, do all the things we needed to do to feel good about ourselves. So um, while Sunday was a little unique because of what, what all was involved, kind of the same pattern. Now we pick up from there. You know, you get four days to, to do the things you need to do to get your arms right, your bodies right, your minds right, and then go out and play on Friday. Those last couple of weeks uh, that you're talking about yet, I don't know if you want to call them side plans, but you're building up for this weekend. Do you feel like all those plans paid off and you're, you're in the spot you wanted to be in entering regionals? I think so. I don't, um, I don't know that anyone can get it to go exactly the way they want. But as we stand here now, um, we're in a similar rhythm to what we were last weekend when we had a, a success, a bunch of, bunch of really good teams. But also you could argue three of the hottest teams in the country swinging the bat we ran into with LSU – uh, Kentucky and also Florida at the time and our pitchers did really well and yet we didn't extend anyone beyond what they've already done at some point or what would be called reasonable and then we also as we stand here today can say everyone's kind of been in the situation we might use them in uh, whether it be starting relieving long relief coming in late coming in to face one guy getting down there and having to get hot really quickly um, so I feel good. We've, we've kind of checked the preparation boxes, and at the same time, we've kind of kept our guys uh, to where they should feel, should feel as fresh as you can feel in the month of June. Wes and then Rick, and then we'll go Troy and Mike after that. Tony, I guess you all are probably a pretty extreme example, but home runs across the country seem to be up again this year, and I know that walks are – getting there too and they're a, a lot higher than they were just even a couple of years ago is college baseball kind of following major league baseball in that way in terms of becoming more of a sort of a, a, a strikeout homer walk kind of game i think you're going to emulate what you see more on tv and i don't know that kids actually watch the games anymore on tv unless they're playoffs or something but they see the highlights and they see things on twitter and so a little bit of that is you're always going to pick up patterns. I forget the, the smart way to say, I heard some broadcasts say, the, the, there's a trickle-down effect. Usually it plays down. The kids in Little League will do what they see in high school, you know, in that way. And sometimes it'll go the other way. They had a good example of that. But anyway, backtracking to that deal, I think guys are going to follow the lead of the best players in the world. Um, the other thing is guys are just getting bigger and stronger by focusing on nutrition, sleep even more. Um, and then this was a year, too, where I know, you know, we didn't see Barco when we went to Florida. And, uh, you know, we didn't see Sims when we went to Mississippi State. Uh, maybe there's a, a little bit of a, an effect from that as well. Um, and then, two, everything's circumstantial. You, the weather is going to be different every spring. That might have had something to do with it. Uh, so while the game may be leaning that way a little bit, you know, each year is different. And there's probably some circumstances that went into those numbers. Hey, Tony, how was the practice back here? How was the uh, practice today? What did you hope to accomplish with your guys on this day before the regional starts? Yeah, I, I think we've kind of got a routine by now that we've settled into for the day prior to Friday or Thursday, in some cases in the SEC and in the tournament. And we wanted to kind of just stick with that routine. Um, and the other thing, too, was just to get the guys up moving around a little bit. Both position players and pitchers ran a little bit get a sweat going, uh, go full speed, at least it's something, get the heart rate going a little bit, and then just, you know, have a good feel going into tomorrow. Just because you practice well on, you know, one day doesn't mean you're going to play well the next, but you kind of want to feel good that things go smoothly, and um, I had that feeling. Again, that's probably more of a coach's sleep better at night thing. The kids probably don't even really care. Uh, all four teams here or at any regional uh, have a high sense of anticipation for tomorrow. That's what they want. 
Tony, you started Chad last year in game one. What went into the decision to give Blade the ball Friday and I guess presumably Chase on Saturday? Yeah, miss Chad, um, for sure. Uh, he was a guy that uh, was imbe deeply embedded in the program and we felt like he was um, a guy who can lead you into something. I think we're blessed with several guys that can do that this year. Um, and that's why we've mixed some things up. But uh, we wanted to kind of stick with, all right, let's get into a little bit of a rhythm here. And Blade led us into the tournament, uh, which our entire team played well. So he'll lead us into this tournament. And much like last week, you're only assured two games. So you might as well not look past that, but you probably want to prepare for those two games. So uh, while we won't put it in stone because it is playoff time, you most likely Dolander will, will be game two. And then we've kind of mapped out the bullpen as we see fit for those two days as well. Again, you got to be willing to go outside of your, your normal box of thinking or your comfort zone as a pitcher and, you know, be anxious to help the team win or, or be happy to help the team win in any shape or form. But right now we'll, we'll kind of, you know, see some similarities to what we did in Hoover. What is it about Frank that, that has made him such a successful pitching coach for, for so long? And then is there anything in particular with, with this team that he's done that's worked so well? You know, he's, he's said it himself before that he doesn't really know. Um, you know, what, it just always worked for him. And, uh, you know, some people will call and say, what would you do with this guy or what's your philosophy or what's your system? And we don't really have that here. We just have a guy that's very competitive um, ultra competitive. I think sometimes y'all get to see it on TV or maybe even in person, but I don't think you can really understand it unless you're around him every day. And he uses that competitiveness to his advantage uh, when, it, when it's working with kids. I mean, he wants to see the very best out of each kid that, it's, that he's working with. And I think we've been able to utilize his talents because we put him in a situation where you know, he helps with the recruiting and he builds relationships with the incoming guys. And He's certainly willing to build personal relationships with the players, in particular the pitchers. But he gears all of his attention and, again, that competitiveness towards figuring out how does Schultz throw as the best he can? What's the key to unlocking Garrett Crochet's potential? And it's a different you know, formula for each guy, and he takes the time to do that and then makes adjustments when it doesn't go well because – the pitcher probably doesn't like it if they don't have a good outing, but I would say equally disappointed or frustrated is the pitching coach, and it drives Coach Anderson to get with those guys and, and figure out what he's got to do. And, uh, you know, I, I think in this – you asked about this year's team. I think he's pretty close with these kids. And uh, anytime you've got any kind of relationship, whether it's coach-player, when there's communication and there's a tight bond, things are typically going to go better than they normally do. How good is it to have guys on this team that were here last year, went through regionals, super regionals, Omaha, and be able to you know, talk to the younger guys on the team? How good is it for the players and for the coaching staff? Yeah, I, I think you reflect back on last Sunday. Um, there's a lot of adrenaline. There's a lot of emotion that goes into playing in the SEC final. Fortunately, can stand here you know, saying done that a couple times, and so can a couple of our players. So while they can't, put Blake Burke up to bat in that situation, they can kind of give him a vision for what it's like. And uh, I think if you have a vision of anything, you can see it, and that could be anything at all. Like you're starting a business and you, you know what you, your customer you customer base, you know what it all is going to look like. It can help you make that happen. And I think our guys can help illustrate to the ones that have not been here, um, you know, this is kind of what it looks like. And visualization is a big, big thing for any athlete. And it aids in that as well as other things. So it, it's huge. And, I, again, I don't, I don't think we win last Sunday or hold that lead or whatever you want to call it or maybe even be in that game without what went on the year prior. Coach, three of the four teams in the Knoxville Regionals are ranked in the top ten home run hitting teams. What excitement do you anticipate Lindsey Nelson bringing this weekend and also how do pitchers prepare to go against these home run hitters? Yeah, you know, um, and pitchers for, for every team, I got to believe, um, will work to do what they do best. And, and maybe you make adjustments along the way if it's called for with the opponent you're facing. Um, but those three teams are in the, you know, the first three teams you mentioned are in that category. And then Alabama State, too, has a dynamic offense, much in part because they're all older and they've been together. And uh, they kind of play with uh, 
you know, a little bit of the flair or swagger, if you want to call it, that a successful team is going to have. So I think the fans are in for a treat as far as the style of baseball they're going to see. And everyone likes to see home runs. There's, there's no guarantee. I mean, some days the wind's howling out 30 miles an hour and you think you're going to see eight of them, four from each team, and you don't see any or you only see one. Uh, so the statistics would say, you know, all four teams are very dangerous as it relates to extra base hits. And uh, I would key in on more that all four play a very exciting brand of offensive baseball. And so if you're a fan watching on TV, you're fortunate enough to have one of these expensive tickets that's floating around, um, then, then you're going to see the type of action that will keep you in the game or even keep you on the edge of your seat. Hey, Tony, going a little more in depth on that, I don't know how much you've scouted at Alabama State, but Corey King is tearing the cover off the ball, 367 with 14 home runs. What do you know about him that makes him so good? Yeah, we kind of had an argument in the office, like who do you think the most dangerous guy is? Because we've looked at it a little bit, and on a lot of the reports, majority of the reports, they label him as the guy that, you know, that either you don't want to beat you or is their best guy, however you want to phrase it. And, you know, what you see out of him is presence. Um, like a lot of the guys, like I said, as you get older and you're comfortable in your skin, you're comfortable with your teammates you've been playing with for a bunch of years, it helps. And I think he has that. But, you know, within that little friendly argument we we're having in the office, we brought up about three or four names. And you'll see there's, there's guys that – move around very athletically in their lineup, but also just have good swings that are easy to see. And then statistically, if you watch on video a guy swing and then you check his numbers, um, again, they've, they've got about four or five guys that have really good numbers. He just happens to be the leadoff guy, uh, and it certainly is a dynamic one. Tony, back in Hoover, you said that uh, you told Chase about 15 minutes before first pitch that he was going to be coming in in relief. How nice is it to have not only him, but the rest of your pitching staff just be that flexible and, and able to work in any situation? I, I think it's the key to this team in general. I would put it more on a bigger scale because a lot of people have said, what do you like most about your team or what do you think is the an X factor for this team? And it stems from in the fall, we've got – a bunch of guys coming in, I'm going to change this program. You know, I got recruited to turn things around and things like And then you got a bunch of guys that are, well, we had a good year last year. And people are talking about – and they didn't mesh together, like, perfectly. You know, everyone wasn't hugging in the locker room after or before practice. I can, I can tell you that. I won't go into any more details. But um, it took some time. And there's a lot of depth, too. There's guys who sat in my office saying, I'm this guy. All right, this is my position. Or I'm going to do this. And they've been flexible, like you said, not just with their pitching roles, um, but when they come in a game, when they don't, how practice goes, who gets left out of this, who gets to do that, who gets credit. And uh, at the end of the day, you can't have a tremendous amount of success in a team sport unless guys are doing that in general. But I think these guys kind of do it to an extreme. So um, I think the pitching is a good example, but really on the whole, it's, it's representative of the team that, you know, hey, you don't gotta like it. I mean. If we don't play you and you're a hitter, if you're not in the lineup, don't sit on the bench and be happy you're not getting to get, get in the box. But certainly pay attention to what's going on in the game so you're prepared to be that guy and support your team because the more we win, the more at-bats that are available, and the same thing goes for the pitchers. Um, everybody's looking to advance. Well, the more games you play in this postseason, the more innings are available. Tony, I know this is <clears> – <throat> Baseball is obviously a, a team sport, but this regional, just for this particular draft, might have seven or eight guys who could potentially be first-round picks in the draft here in a couple months. Could you just sort of speak to the overall talent level that's at this regional? It seems like there's, there's quite a lot of individual skill here. Yeah, I didn't realize that out of the shoot. I mean, Monday for us, as you mentioned, was kind of a, our first lazy day in a while, and I took advantage of that. Um, yeah, I, was watch I watched Norm McDonald's special on Netflix instead of the show. That guy's cr I know most people think he's crazy and, and aren't fans, but I was dying laughing, so it was good comedic relief. As the week went on and learned more and more about the, the groups, I mean, you know you've got good teams. It doesn't matter who you're going to play this time of year. You see what you're talking about. There are guys who are going to play this game for a long, long time. And, again, I'll go back to – why burn a bunch of energy worrying about who, you, who you're going to host or if you're traveling, who you're going to play? Because, again, they're all going to be good teams. But I think this is a little bit different with this group you have here. You pointed out an outlier. There's not many regionals that can brag that they have that many potential first-rounders, what you're talking about, like this current year. And then there's always going to be embedded guys like a Cruz or guys like that that, you know, down the road will be first-rounders as well. There's plenty of those in this deal, too. 
Um, but overall, it's, it's an outlier. And it's something for people to get excited about that are going to follow this regional. Or if they're not, it should grab their attention for certain. So, Tony, two things. Breon Pooler, what have you seen from him? And then do you expect Jared Dickey to be more than a pinch hitter this weekend? And if so, how uh, fun of a decision will that be for you with the way Blake Burke's been swinging the bat? Yeah, um, you know, Breon's not scared. And Jordan Beck knows him well. Um, kind of your shortstop converted pitcher type guy. So you know he's a good athlete. He's shown, shown that he can throw a lot of strikes. And then I don't want to give false information, but I know he came in for a fact in the final after starting and throwing 100 pitches. And you don't do that unless you want the ball. And, of course, his teammates wanted him to have the ball. But he threw an excess amount of pitches on Sunday to help them win that thing. And then I think he was the guy who came in against Auburn when they had a lead to, to shut that thing down. So he's, he's kind of their guy um, that they like to hand the ball to. And he's certainly not afraid, and that's probably the reason why. And I think you're going to get some strikes in particular with his fastball. Um, so that's kind of to the extent we know about him. And then, yeah, I mean, we've talked about it. This team has made a lot of decisions difficult, and it's kind of funny when the older guys that maybe want to coach when they're done playing, you know, they're, they're trying to kind of learn like I did and think through situations, and they don't envy you at all. And you know, Coach Anderson made me feel bad about myself in the office today because he said Camden Sewell could have threw a complete game on Sunday, which we wanted Camden Sewell to be available tomorrow, um, and everything seemed to work out all right against Florida. So that's an argument we can just put in the closet. But it's, it's a challenge when you have good options. Um, so it's nice to look smart when you use a guy in this situation and someone can say, well, that move worked out. Well, what you had is a good player that's sitting there anxious to contribute, and you give him a chance you know, the percentages are in your favor. And in Dickey's case, he's been running around in the outfield. Um, he looks a lot better. I'm confident he can run the bases as needed. I think we'd be pushing the envelope a little too much if he was out in, in the field defensively. Uh, but I don't think it's, it's much to say or going too, too far to say uh, he could have a, a game where he has multiple at-bats. Um, but Burke will get plenty, and there will be other guys out there too. Uh, and, again, fortunately for me, you don't see attitudes change. You just got a bunch of guys that want to win for each other. Thank you, Coach. Thanks, Tony. Thank you, guys.